Hey, my name is Pradeep. Can you guys hear me properly? Yeah. Cool. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about XMPP and Ruby today. And uh, that's my contact sheet. Okay. I work for Incredia. We're based out of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we do design, development, and strategy for a bunch of web applications. Uh, our flagship product is Presently, and we also do CrowdSoft. Uh, we are based out of, uh, oh, uh, we're also based out of the area, Atlanta, Maine, because we all have people there. Our, our uh, employees are actually scattered all over the country. Uh, okay, so what is XMPP? How many here have, do actually know of it? Or, yeah. So, can someone who knows of it explain? In what context they know it in? That's GTOP, yeah. So traditional IM. Uh, that is sadly the only context that is known in a lot of, uh, for a lot of people. And you know, I'm trying to change that. A lot of other people are trying to do so as well. So SMPP actually stands for the Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. It, it is a class of software, I mean, it falls in a class of software called uh, Messenger Engine Middleware. And of course, uh, it's not the guy talked about the middleware today, so we will going to play it again. Uh, it's completely XML based. Uh, there are various XMPP servers, some of those called uh, EJVD, OpenFire, Tugase, I'll talk about this in a little bit. And of course, it's most known for being the back end for a lot of XML messaging systems. Uh, you can read more about it at smpp.org, where there are also a list of features and so on. So the good thing about XMPP, there's actually quite a few, is first and foremost it's open, so anybody can contribute new features and uh, they can comment on features that are already submitted, and you can write your own XMPP servers, everything is open. And it's also standardized by the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, it's also decentralized, you can run your own servers anywhere. And most of these servers can actually talk to each other. It's very mature, it's been about 10 years or so since it started. And now it's actually catching on a bit more now that we can go there and the edit it and source and we're going to start contributing. It's very customizable if you pick the right SMDP server. I'll talk more about this soon. And since it's message based, it's actually pretty fast. Uh, it, most of the servers are optimized for uh, sending messages between various uh, clients very quickly. Okay, so the bad news is the XML is very verbose. Some people call it over-engineered, but I don't think so. Uh, the documentation, it's, it's readable and it's there, but it's not outlined properly. Most of the people who actually wrote this documentation focus more on the specifications than actually teaching people how to use it. But there are efforts going on right now to make it better. There are a lot of blog articles and so on that you can use. Uh, and on larger networks, since uh, presence is very important, there's a lot of uh, data overhead for just sending around presence data to see if you know, somebody's online or not. And another thing that's being worked on is that you can't send unmodified binary data file transfers because it's, uh, everything is in XML. So usually the encoder is in base 64 and send it to the assignment of the platform. So, a simple SMDP stands uh, look like that. You would have a message from a person to another person, and there's a body that's as basic as it gets. And highlighted in blue, that's the, what they call the JIT, which consists of the username and the server name. That's pretty much how they can run. And it's a unique identifier for every user. And on a, a slash after that, that's the resource, which is an identifier for the client that is connected to the server at the time. You can have many resources, which means you can connect using multiple clients on multiple machines, and you can set groups, you can set uh, priorities so that certain clients get messages quicker than the other ones, or, and so on. Which is why you can sign up to GDoc and get multiple clients. So some XMPP features, uh, you can find a big list on xmpp.org. The first and most important one is present. You can tell if somebody's connected or not. This removes a lot of overhead, and passing data around. Only the people who need to get it will get it. And of course, instant messaging, and I'm going to talk more about that. 
Uh, publish subscribe is when you, you post something to a node and everybody gets it. If you subscribe to a node, everybody gets it free, almost close to instantly. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Multi user chat. Uh, for example, if you sign up to jabber.org and participate in one of those conference rooms. Federation, uh, you can connect to various SMTP servers and you can talk to people on other SMTP servers using your SMTP server. Personal eventing is, for example, when you're using AD in your game, you're switching songs in your music player and it instantly changes your music, uh, what you're playing across the, the network and your other friends see it. That's, person, that's an example of personal eventing. So that's all in the past. I'm going to talk a little bit about the future and what's actually going on right now. Uh, any questions so far? So I want to talk about publish subscribe first. It's getting a lot of press at the moment because we're realizing, especially in the Rails world, that certain architectures Rails isn't really set up to do, for example, Twitter or uh, I mean, we need to use Rails to be presently it's pretty much uh, very similar to Twitter in some respects. So we had to look into this and we found out that public subscribe is actually very viable and effective for us. So what essentially happens is there's a node on an XTPP server and uh, people will subscribe to that node. And the moment somebody publishes something, everybody will get a notification. So in this case, uh, stanza looks something like this. You have an IQ, which is a wrapper stanza. Uh, from me at xmtp.bar to the popsub pop -sub server. And then you, you create another popsub uh, element inside that uh, sets the namespace. And after that, you specify which you node know you're publishing into. So in this case, you're publishing into the Apple server. And we're going to publish the Fuji Apple file. And the moment you publish it, all the subscribers will instantly get the Fuji Apple file in their. Uh, so, using publish subscribe, we can do a lot of cool stuff. First, and uh, something close to our hearts and interior is uh, microblogging, because we're using really custom data for And uh, we're actually using the personal eventing protocol. So, the way we do microblogging is that uh, everybody who is registered on presently has a, uh, an account on the XMTP server. And just like changing songs, you can change your status. And of course, we persist the status on uh, the back end. And every time you change your status, everybody who is following you will instantly get an update to the cluster. Um, so that's how that works. And uh, you can also do real-time search. For example, if Google buys Twitter, then Twitter can say, I want to let me create a, all updates in a way. And then Google or whatever search engine can subscribe to it. Every time they get a new update, they'll push it to the updates node, and uh, uh, Google and Yahoo or whoever wants the data will get it. So, you can also do real-time topic tracking. So it's like RSS, except, uh, I mean, of course, this would require some heavy players to uh, actually set the feeds up running. Uh, but if you want to you know, listen to Ali or Utah on Twitter, then maybe you set up, a, you, you want to track it somewhere, and you can cross your phones and I am in process as well. You can also do collaborative editing. Uh, this is purely theoretical. I, I tried to write it up, but I got lazy and I didn't put it in uh, <laughs> So using PubSub, you just have one big text box. Of, I'm just uh, talking to you guys at the moment. So you'll have one big text box, and everybody who's connected to it will make changes, and those changes will get pushed up to a PubSub mode and then it will just send out to everybody else and you can keep the, the documents in like that. Any questions about PubSub? Okay, moving on. So I would also like to talk about real-time user interfaces. Uh, has anyone here used Presently? Besides me and Brandon, my co-worker. Okay, it's Presently. Okay, so... Uh, we recently updated it to be a lot more alive. Before it was just uh, jQuery and polling. Now it uses uh, XMPP to get the messages into your uh, screen. So think of Twitter with like 10 times more liveliness on your public screen. 
So we're doing that using something called Bosch, which I'm going to explain in detail a little bit more. But what I really want to get across is that uh, JavaScript-based XMPP clients are really mature at the moment. And if you can, you should be using them to make your user interfaces really shine. Um, you can uh, jQuery and Stroke, which is what we're using, in itself will almost be close to 100% real-time UI if you use SMTP correctly. And, um, the way to actually get these features in, uh, I'm going to show you how to work with Ruby and SMTP on the back end, and I'll show you the libraries after that you're on your own. And uh, on the front end, I'll show you how to connect it to your web server, I mean, to, your, uh, to, the, to the client's browser using JavaScript. So at the moment, presently is using uh, Bosch user interfaces. Also, Drop.io has a full 100% real-time UI. Is anybody here from Drop.io? You're from Drop.io? No? OK. But have you seen their new interface? Do you like it? OK, he likes it. So, so let's talk a bit about the back end. Um, there's only, in my opinion, only two good Ruby libraries for XMPP out there. The first one is XMPP for R. It's been around for a while. For I, I think about over maybe over three or four years. It's very full featured. It's threaded and event based. But the bad news is there's almost uh, you know, documentation is non existent. Uh, I, it took me a long time to figure out what was going on. Very steep learning curve. And because of the Threads, you can't really you can't really directly run it in a Rails app. You'll have to uh, run external daemon and uh, connect to it using Rails and do whatever you can with it. Uh, I would recommend this for XMPP applications that don't have to interface with Rails, uh, like Twitter Spy. Does everybody use Twitter Spy? Yeah, Twitter Spy is saying that. Uh, Twitter Spy is a open source Ruby project where you can connect to it using uh, GTOP or whatever XMPP account. And you can say track this topic. And it will go to Twitter and pull from it and uh, send you items every time something else. Something will happen. It's written in Ruby, so, and the guy hasn't done any scaling work on it, I believe. So don't sign up because I'm on it. And if you sign up, it'll make it slower for me. Yeah, uh, I like that anyway. <laughs> Huh? It's down right now anyway. It's down right now anyway. <laughs> well, if somebody wants to post it, then we'll put it on there. And you can um, just fork it and make some changes or whatever. But that uses SMPP for R. Uh, we are looking for contributors for Stroke Ruby. And this is built off LibStroke, which is a really good C SMPP library. We have most of the, the code uh, ready, and it's connecting. We're using it in production. But uh, it's not ready for release to the public because we don't want to end up supporting it for like two, three years because we don't know how to write documentation. So uh, if you can write documentation and you can actually uh, condense down really complex code into a very easy to use interface, we could use your help. Uh, I'm going to actually work on this a little bit and put up some documentation up after the conference. So uh, I'll post my Twitter about it. So the good news about Stroke Ruby is that you can actually run this within a Rails application. You don't have to run in a uh, run it in a game. Uh, but you will have to connect to the XMPP server every time, which adds a little bit of overhead, but in the long run, it doesn't really affect the response times as much. And of course, if you're working on the back end with XMPP, I recommend that you don't do any long running tasks within the Rails application. And you always check your time on some exception after. So, any questions about that? Okay. I suggest that you do, if you are working with Ruby and XMPP, I suggest that you, and Rails, I'm sorry, that you do most of the work on the front end. So, I would highly recommend that you use a JavaScript based XMPP client and uh, use that in, your, in the client's uh, browser and make it receive XMPP messages so that you have a faster interface and your Rails app doesn't get tied down. So the way to do this is to leverage uh, a new, excuse me, to leverage a new, uh, uh, how do I say this? Protocol, I'm sorry. 
that's a protocol called VOD, which stands for bidirectional streams or synchronous HTTP. Of course, HTTP is a request response protocol and it's not completely synchronous, so it's not really easy to do long running streams with uh, HTTP, and those are the kinds that are required for an SMTP uh, connection. So, an alternative to this is Comet. Uh, anyone here heard of Comet? So if you're ever, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but if you were watching Matt Rumors Live or one of those websites, one of them had a comic, a comic based uh, push server. So when you connected, they were typing away updates from um, WWDC or something, and you got them really quickly. And that was the only website that survived that year. Every other one just went down. So Comet requires a single persistent connection to the HTTP server. But Bosch doesn't. Bosch can survive over disconnects. It can survive over changing to multiple networks. It's pretty robust. And uh, it's full form HTTP requests that are passed around between the client and the XMPP server. So it goes through most proxies. In brief outline, uh, it starts at the client. The client will connect to a Bosch connection manager, which will then forward the request to the XMPP server. In most new SMTP servers like eJavaD, uh, there is actually a Bosch connection manager embedded within the server, so you don't have to run it separately. Um, whatever. So the way that it works is like this. Uh, there are two conditions. The client, every time the request receives a message from the SMTP, I'm sorry, from the Bosch connection manager, will have to return something. And the same goes for the, the SMTP server. Every time you sorry for the connection manager. Every time it receives something, it has to return something. So let's say you know, the client will say, I want to authenticate, and the server's like, okay, fine, authenticate, and the client says, here's the password, server's okay, you're logged in. The client says, I'm waiting for messages, and the server has to return something, but it can wait for a very long time, we use long billing requests. And the server will wait and say, I don't have anything, and we send that to the client. The client will say, okay, that's fine, you don't have anything. Now, I'm waiting again and the server will wait for a while. If it gets something, we send it to the client, otherwise it would say, I don't have anything, and we send it back. So there's a chain that goes on, and it's, it, can ma it maintains for a very long time. Um, and this is pretty much our buffer. Um, is, are you understanding this, or should I explain again? Got it? Okay. So uh, we use Bosch with JavaScript to write really responsive user interfaces. And we can do that using Strofe, which is written by Jack Moffat. Uh, he has a very cool blog at metajack.im. And he works for Chess Park. Uh, and if you listen to the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, the Brizza has uh, wuchess.com. I believe they're a Chess Park spin-off. This is something I want to do. Uh, so Strofe is used in production presently and at Chess Park. And it's very, very awesome. I highly, highly recommend and an example of the code. So first you see you can create a new connection that uh, maps to the slash HTTP bind uh, on your website, which will theoretically forward to the SMTP server. And you would connect using your username and your password, and you give it a handler function. So after it connects, it would call the on connect function. After that, you can attach handlers for each SMTP stanza. So if you receive a message stanza, like I showed before, then you can attach a handler so that it would call the on message uh, function every time it gets a message stanza. And moving on, if you you can also specify namespaces, so you can say any pub sub event that is also a message should be handled by the on pub sub event function. Um, this is very powerful. I'm only showing like three lines of code, but uh, you guys should look into it and uh, see what you can come up with. So, I mm -hmm. have about 10 minutes. So, I'd like to talk about presently a little bit and the gains that we got from switching to SMTP. Uh, let me demo that. Our present application. Can you guys see that? 
crash test you want to save that. This is internal. Uh, and we use it within a trigger. I'm not showing sure anything sensitive, so we'll probably won't get back. Uh, So at this point, this is connected to the SMTP server. And oh, I see it's a little bit of Well, I just like this is all. Can someone Is this on? So if I send a message right here. At this point, it's posting to Rails. Rails will then forward the update to the XMPP server, which will then send it back to the browser using Bosch. Uh, and we are not making any requests from the Rails server at this point. All it's doing is posting the, all it's doing is posting the update to the Rails server, and after that, Bosch will take care of it. If the XMPP server will forward a message and the functions that I have set up using Stroke will render the update right here. So that's pretty much the quick demo. And then we'll get back to the presentation. So this is the architecture we have before we switch to XMPP. Uh, we do add out development, so we don't really want to prematurely optimize anything. So we had a you know, a regular browser and we had a, uh, I'm sorry, a regular uh, jQuery interface. And it would constantly pull and it would get new updates. It's pretty much the most basic Twitter app you can write. And then we found we had some problems with um, um, our servers getting hammered. So we set up a custom index to get our updates uh, sorted out and, and the website more responsive. And we also have some support again. And then we needed to scale because people started coming to the site and we were getting publicity. So uh, then we moved to this architecture. So what happens is the client will, like I, like I said, the client will only post to Rails. It will get the initial page and then we we'll post to Rails on every new update. And then Rails will forward to eJavaD using Scruff Ruby. And eJavaD will of course, we hooked up to the client using Bosch, and it will send the, uh, the notification to the client, just like just as if the client is a regular uh, instant messaging client. I'm sorry, just as if the browser is a regular instant messaging client. Uh, any questions? About this? And it scales really, really well. Uh, our, our load average is pretty high now. We can even, we can even run the whole app on a single machine, and the uh, SMTP server on another machine, and we still hold up very well for a very long time. Uh, but even if you have another thousand pounds, it's still be. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I was supposed to be done. So a little few words about SMTP servers. Uh, each IRD is written in Erlang. It's highly scalable, actively maintained. And if you know Erlang, it's very easy to hack. Uh, the the XMPP server we are running at presently is eJavaD, and it's heavily customized for us. So don't try that at home. Uh, it also runs at Chess Park, I believe. JavaD2 is a rewrite of the original Java server. It's written in C. It is being actively maintained. And I think it's pretty fast and easily customizable. I've been looking at it. Uh, I've heard people saying, talking about that. Tigase is written in Java. It is actively maintained. The Seismic guys really love Tigase. Uh, they have a video, YouTube, I'm oh, sorry. So it's like a video conversation site. And they use SMDP heavily. And they really love Tigase. OpenFire is written in Java, actively maintained. Most enterprise IAM uh, networks use OpenFire from what I gather. If they can't figure out how to set up the Java D, then OpenFire is the next bit. Next best bet. Uh, it's a large community, lots of plugins, and if you're writing basic XMPP apps, you just send messages back and forth, and it's fine. You can use it. Uh, Pro City is brand new. I haven't looked at it at all. 
but I wanted to kind of want to move up the list. It's with Nagula, and the thing that's really likely and extensible. Uh, if you guys are interested in any of this, you should check that out. Now. But overall, what I'm trying to convey is that there are already solutions present for most of the common enterprise uh, problems. And uh, a lot of the solutions are already spec'd out very thoroughly in the SMTP, uh, on the SMTP website, and a lot of the servers do implement it. Of course, you're going to find some servers don't implement certain features that you want and some do. But you know, that's something that's just going to get better with time. And with you guys help, if you want to contribute, it would be really awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. So, any questions? Questions? What kind of throughput do you get on the JavaScript as an XMPD client? Uh, well, like, are most of our, see, that's the thing. It's, uh, well, all of our messages go through the JavaScript. So, anything that's posted to presently will, if they're using the web browser as a client, then, the web interface as a client, then it will go to the JavaScript and get to the user. Uh, we have a JavaScript fallback just in case that SMTP server goes down, but that hasn't happened yet. And uh, I don't think it'll ever happen because the Jabber is pretty stable. Uh, as far as daily updates, I mean, we have over like a million updates right now, and a good fraction of those went through the SMTP server, and we haven't had a single missed update so far. What about on the JavaScript side? Like oh. on the client itself? Right. Right? Like e jabber e scales really well. Mm -hmm. Like if I send a thousand messages to a it'll JavaScript get client, it'll get everything. Well, of course, you know, I mean you have to account for that. We prune updates so it doesn't just add on to the bottom and then crash your browser. So you have to be careful that your browser doesn't you know take a volume number and crash. But uh, if, even if you send a thousand updates at one time and you tested this, all thousand will get to the browser. And unless the browser crashes, then you know you're getting it. Any other questions? Yes? Are you st still using uh, separate bots to talk to uh, other Jabber servers, or have you hooked that up directly to eJabber? Uh, we're working on that. Uh, it's, uh, the gateway support in eJabber is very, very powerful. But we have something in the works that's going to blow with those lines. And it's going to actually affect all of your Ruby guys as well. Um, but what we're doing is we're reporting Lib Purple. To uh, Ruby. Look purple is the, if you're using ADM on game, that's the engine that runs it. So anything that will run on ADM, will, I mean, that ADM can connect to, or game can connect to, will soon be able to connect to using your Ruby apps. We're working on that uh, ETA, I don't know. <laughs> but most of it's done, maybe next week. Any other questions? Purple Ruby. Yes. Do you know about the XLMPP implementation of Vertebra? Oh, Vertebra. Uh, no, but I know they use it. That's about it. I haven't looked into it very uh, in detail. But I know uh, Vertebra uses XMPP and AMQP, if I, believe, if I understand it correctly. Uh, but I don't know the exact details. I think they use XMPP mostly for presence. I'm not mistaken. Anybody from Engineer here who can confirm? using 
we're using it the right way, I believe. I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> uh, we haven't had any problems so far, and PubSub is the way to go. From you know what I can tell at this point, it's scaling beautifully. It's not having any problems, and I think I'll probably be using PubSub for other projects besides Fedora too. Questions?